Hello everyone, my name is Vera Vinken. I am a PhD student at Newcastle University. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about my PhD project, which I just started this year. Um, my talk is... Hello everyone, my name is Vera Vinken. I am a PhD student at Newcastle University. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about my PhD project, which I just started this year. Um, my talk is... OK, so let's get started. Um, as you might know, some birds, such as several tit species, remain at northern latitudes during the winter. For example, blue tits and cold tits can be seen in British gardens over winter. These birds need to survive cold weather, short days and long nights, whilst little food is available. This can be a real challenge, especially since these tit species that we're talking about today are small birds with a high metabolism that need a lot of stored energy to survive the night. Because the fat reserve that the bird has at the end of the day is burned up during the night and the energy that is released is used to keep the bird warm so it can actually survive. It's therefore very important for them to build up enough fat reserve during the day so they can survive the cold long nights. One thing that some birds do to deal with these challenges is hoarding food. For example, marsh tits, willow tits and cold tits can be seen here in England hiding food that they find to eat at a later point in time. That way they provide themselves with safe and reliable food source. But what does this food hoarding behaviour actually look like? Generally birds that are hiding food that they find look like birds that are foraging. They move between branches and other substrates um, like bits of trees or branches to find a good place to hide the food. We can easily tell this bird's behaviour apart from foraging behaviour because the bird will be holding a food item instead of looking for it. So here we see a, a bird performing food hoarding behaviour. You can see that the bird picks up a seed, moves around, looking for a place to hide, and here it will hide the bit of food underneath the apples in the moss. And once it has done so, it will return back to pick up another seed. Okay, so now we know what food hoarding behaviour is. The question is, when do these birds hoard? Well, food hoarding starts in the autumn when there is a lot of food available. The birds hide some of this to retrieve it later in winter, which is one way of solving the issue of the low food availability in winter. But the hoarding actually continues during the cold winter months if the birds have the opportunity. These are often small amounts that will be retrieved after a short amount of time, for example, within the same day. So the current thinking within our lab about how this hoarding actually works and when birds do hoard focuses on the challenge for these birds of having enough fat during the night. As I told you before, it is really important that at the end of the day, the fat reserves are large enough to provide the birds with energy for the night. Um, so to get these large fat reserves at the end of the day, the birds have a couple of issues. One problem is that these birds have very small stomachs. Sometimes they might find a relatively large amount of food that they cannot eat all at once, simply because it won't fit in their stomachs. Here, stomach size is the limit. On other occasions, they might not have enough food at all, so food availability can be limiting as well. And we think that hoarding behaviour solves both of these issues by saving food that cannot be eaten at one time for another time when there's no food available. This helps the birds reach the ultimate goal, which is if the stomach stays filled, they will have more fat at the end of the day, which is better to survive the nights. So this brings us to our research question. We have just set out these birds as doing this food hoarding behavior in order to survive the next night. But we do not think that they actually con are consciously aware that they need the fat to survive the night. Their behaviour is probably driven by ecological and environmental processes. The problem here is that we can see behaviour. We can, for example, see birds hoarding, eating or resting, but we cannot see the processes that underlie them and produce these behaviours. 
Therefore, in this research project, we would like to understand what these environmental and ecological factors are and how they drive the decision making about whether to hoard or not. Previous work that's been done by other research groups has indicated that the following factors could be of importance. The first two, temperature and daylight, are two examples that could determine if a bird would go into a hoarding state. This would be a state where the motivation to hoard is high. Is high. For example, in temperature, colder nights require higher fat reserves so they can actually survive the nights, and birds could get temperature cues from their environment. Then there is daylight. The length of the days gets shorter in winter, which means nights are getting longer, and the longer the night, the higher the fat reserve that you will actually need. This can also be cues from the environment that the bird takes up. On the other hand, there is um, factors that are inside of the bird, such as the stomach content, which works on a more short term basis. So if a bird is already in a state of high motivation to hoard, the actual content of the stomach at a certain point of in time can, deter can influence the decision if the bird will eat a food item it finds or not. So in summary, we want to know what the decision rules are that these animals use and what factors, such as the ones I just mentioned, could be important and play a role in this. So, in order to answer a research question, I make computational models of food hoarding birds. These models are simplified representations of birds and contain sets of rules about when the birds hoard, forage, rest and sleep, for example. When you take a look at the diagram of the model bird that I've made here on the slide, you can see that there are certain factors or variables that go into the model. So these are temperature, daylight, food availability and many more. These are then subjected to the decision rules that are inside the model or in the, bird, in the model bird and a certain output is given. In this case, the output are behaviours that we can see, such as eating, hoarding or resting. What I'll be doing is that I'll be changing rules and variables around to investi investigate how these changes change the outcome behaviours that we see. But models are all good and well, but I could probably build a model that can do anything I'd like. I could change the, the decision rules and the different types of variables that I put in and basically get any outcome. But that's not what we're interested in. We are interested in knowing what model represents reality best. So what I want to do is once I've finished my models and I have an idea of what I think is a good realistic model, I want to compare the model behaviour, so these outputs, to the bird behaviours that we can get from observational data. And models that match the bird's behaviour best are most likely to represent what really is going on inside these birds. Okay. So to be able to compare the output of my models to real bird behaviour, I will need observational data from real birds. For this, I'll be using citizen science. This means that I'll be recruiting volunteers to watch birds that show hoarding behaviour their, at their own garden feeders. Volunteers will be recording what species they see, what behaviours they see, um, and if possible, what kind of food the, the birds pick up. The data that these volunteers record together with information about the weather, temperature and day length, can then be compared to the models that I've made to see if my models match reality. So if you are a keen bird watcher and you would like to get involved in my project to help me understand better how food hauling behaviour in birds works, there are two ways to do so. This winter, from January to April, I'll be running a pilot study and I'll be looking for volunteers to help us test and improve the observation protocols so they are as easy and quick as possible to use in the future. In the next couple of years, so that would be for the winter of 2023 and 2024, we'll be looking for more volunteers to collect more data. This data will then be used to check if our models are correct. So if you are interested, please get in touch at the email address here on the slide. Okay, so that was it for me for today. Um, I'd like to thank the Leverhulme Trust and Newcastle University for funding my project and the Natural History Society of Northumbria for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And of course, you thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy listening to the other talks in the series as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please get in touch.